But what I find interesting is that if Jada really thought I can't be alone, something's really wrong. I'm I like it's it's somebody better show up right now or I might not be here tomorrow. Why would you not call somebody in LA to come and be with you? You know, I'm not saying she didn't feel super dark and scared and sad, and I'm not saying she didn't have a panic attack. But what I'm saying is if she really thought that that it was either get some help in here or I I'm gone. You don't call somebody who has to make flight arrangements to get there. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise. We're reading another chapter of Worthy today. This is chapter nine. It's called The Breakdown. And she fully comes unglued in this chapter. We also get some Will Smith in this chapter, too. He's right at the beginning of the chapter. And she sort of describes him as sort of crawling towards her, trying to get her attention. And, you know, she's not having any of that. She doesn't have the time of day for him, you know? So what if he has his own show? So that's an interesting dynamic. But we start with that, but then we get fully into how she's just melting down. And we saw it coming. Now, if you didn't have a chance to see the last episode, and I don't blame you if you didn't catch it because I I uploaded it late at night when I don't usually work. And so if it if it didn't hit your feed or whatever, I'd go back and watch that one first. It was very good. It was a good, good, good chapter. And she was very forthcoming about her struggles. In that chapter, she discussed how supposedly she was living the dream from the outside. It looked like she had everything she wanted. She showed up in Hollywood. She rose through the ranks fairly quickly. She had success very fast. She was making um, TV and then she made the almost impossible leap to movies. And she's 19. She's got as much money as she could ever want. And wait, this is the worst. You know, she's, she just feels so empty, so broken. And so she's doing lots of coping with drugs, with alcohol, lots and lots of promiscuity. And she feels like she can't tell anybody how she's really feeling because if she goes back home to Baltimore and complains, you know, everyone's like, why don't you shut up? You know, your life is awesome. And so it's isolating. However, in that episode, she does talk about the fact that because she and Tupac had the same meteoric rise at the same time, they could kind of lean on each other and talk about how disappointing success actually is. Because when you get everything you want, you still go with you. You and all your hangups are still showing up. You just have lots of money in your pockets now. So that was a really interesting chapter because she's much more forthcoming about her shortcomings, her true emotions, what was really happening, how she was really coping. Um, It was a good chapter. So if you haven't had a chance, I'd watch that one first because it's going to be really informative as to why she has the breakdown that she has in this chapter. And if you were living the life that she describes in the previous chapter, you'd have a breakdown too. So um, anyway, if you haven't seen that one, stop this video now, go back to that one and come back to this one. Anyway, let's get started. As always, if you would, please hit the like button. Helps the algorithm. If you can hit the like button, then YouTube will push this video and then more people get a chance to see it. And if you would uh, check your subscription, make sure you're subscribed. Um, if you haven't subscribed, then if you would do that. And if you'd send to a friend, that'd be awesome because who knows, they might really need some frivolous content in their life in a day and age when it feels like the world is literally coming to an end. So sometimes you just need something fun to listen to. Do your friend a favor send them something fun. Okay, so we start out. She's in Wilmington, North Carolina. She's making a movie. She's in the most podunk town ever. There's nothing there. She's uh, staying in a Holiday Inn, and there's nowhere to go except for a Hooters and a Chinese restaurant run by Southern people. Um, So she is quite dismissive about her environment, and it is into this environment that Will Smith comes courting. Now, she had met him before, We've discussed that before. She had bumped into him when she went to audition for Fresh Prince before she had come into any real success. And he had asked, you know, he'd been like, hey, what's up? And, you know, she didn't pay him any mind. I mean, so what if he's the star of the show? What difference does that make to her? She's got places to be and she she doesn't have the time to be blinded by his star. So she's like, yeah, what's up? And she walks on her merry way. Then the other time she'd seen him, she was shopping at a department store with her mother, who should come trotting through with his bouncy step and backpack, but Will Smith. Her mother's like, why can't you date a nice boy like that? And she's like, the Fresh Prince, corny. You know, she didn't have time for that. And so up until this point, all we've gotten from Jada when it comes to Will Smith is the fact that she just thinks he's just sort of like this little cheerful, you know, non-entity, basically. And 
you know, she just looks at him as just kind of a cornball. And she just feels like he is not a, a person that she wants in her sphere. So there she is in Wilmington, North Carolina. She's with Dwayne Martin and they're on the set of The Inkwell. She said that he came to her and he said, hey, my good friend Will Smith wants to fly over here to North Carolina because he wants to have a conversation with you uh, about a role. She's like, cool, whatever, because she's in Wilmington, North Carolina. There's nothing to do unless you want to go hang out at the Hooters. So she's got time on her schedule. She says that there were not a lot of options where to wine and dine well for their little conversation about the role he wants to give her. There's the Hooters next door of the Holiday Inn where they're staying on one side. On the other side is a Chinese restaurant, she says, with a southern twang. And she found that weird and unnatural, but they still chose a Chinese restaurant. Will arrived in North Carolina from Atlanta, Georgia, where he was working on a project. And he, Dwayne, and I met at the Chinese restaurant. Will began by saying that he'd flown down to ask me personally if I would play his girlfriend, a series regular on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. The sitcom had been a huge success for several seasons, so the answer was seemingly a no-brainer. The show was proven. But at this time, I wasn't interested in going back to television. Since Menace, a lot of movie opportunities had become available to me. As nicely as I could, I explained to Will, thanks for flying all the way here, but I don't want to do TV right now. Thank you for the opportunity. And that was that. Okay, uh-huh. I would. I am not even going to judge that because The Fresh Prince was a huge television show, obviously. I think we all watched it, at least an episode or two. We know what show that is. But if you had made what seemed like the impossible leap from television to movies in the 90s, I don't think you would want to go back to television um, where you might never be able to dig your way out. It seemed in her mind like a step down. Now, if Will Smith had come to her when she was living on Comey Avenue, you know, working three jobs and said, hey, do you want to be my girlfriend on my TV shows? Of course she would have jumped at it. But she's not quite as needy as she once was. So Will was gracious and understood. He left as swiftly as he had arrived. Dwayne started giving me a hard time at the restaurant and then accompanied me to my suite at the Holiday Inn, not glamorous, but roomy, to convince me to reconsider. His concern was that Hollywood wasn't regularly turning out roles for black actresses. He also stressed the importance of a guaranteed income on a crossover mega-hit comedy series like Fresh Prince. It didn't have to interrupt my film career, he pointed out. You can do both TV and movies, you know, he said. I agreed, only no, that's not what I want to do. Despite the odds, I wanted to take my shot at being a film star, even though I had nothing slated next. That was a risk. By the same token, what if I went back to TV and I lost my hard-won foothold as a film actress? Dwayne wasn't having it. He felt I was banking on longevity that was unrealistic. How many scripts are being written for black actresses, Jada? Don't be stupid. I can't let you turn down this kind of a financial security. Get cashed up and make movies on hiatus. Although he had a point. I stayed firm. I don't want to. Dwayne was pissed and did his best to convince me I was making the biggest mistake of my life. It was a heated exchange, but I wouldn't give in, to the point that when he left my room, I slammed the door on him. Shortly after, he came back, knocked, and asked in a conciliatory tone, You want to go get a drink? After opening the door a crack but keeping the latch on, I called out, No! Go to Hooters by yourself! I slammed the door. Discussion over. Dwayne left it alone. My decision was sound, I believe, then and now. Movies gave me the opportunity to do a variety of roles, go from project to project, and not be stuck in one role on TV under contract when you didn't have a Debbie Allen to fight for you to do the movies. So, you know, I think some people who want to be overly negative about Jada, and I often fall in that camp, would say that she's just being stubborn. You know, this was a great opportunity. But if you had a deep-seated fear of never being able to get back out of TV once you had gained a foothold, um, I can completely understand where she's coming from. I don't really understand the TV movie business, obviously. And I certainly don't understand what was going on in the 90s, when according to her, it was so much harder to make that transition. I believe it probably was. I mean, these are not the days of Netflix where Netflix itself is making movies and, you know, you can get some big name actors on TV shows and stuff like that. I mean, the entire scene is different. So I understand why she wanted to stick with what to her seemed like a more prestigious um, avenue and also one that afforded her the ability to play different characters. It would be terrible if you got stuck in a role that you absolutely despised and then people get used to seeing you as that character and then it's hard to break out of that character when you finally do have a chance to do movies. I think doing movies would be a lot more fun. I mean imagine if she'd been on Blossom. She would have been playing that 12 year old you know prepubescent child for like forever and eternity if that had been her first role. Anyway 
She goes on to say that as those other opportunities came, including films like Set It Off and A Low Down Dirty Shame, she was climbing the ladder to leading lady, and she had learned to adapt to other challenges. As a case in point, when I was up for Jason's lyric, my audition process lasted until the final hours before principal photography began in Houston. She said that she went and auditioned for this movie called Jason's Lyric. And it was an arduous process because they did not feel that she was right for the role. As always, they felt that she was rough around the edges. That's always what they say about her. She's rough around the edges, but they don't just mean her East Coast accent. Just physically, she was not what they were looking for. She said that the director and producer told her she could not pull off the, the role because, once again, she was rough around the edges. She said that Doug McHenry, the director's vision, was that, like the character's name, the actress who played her would have a softer essence and quality in juxtaposition to the harsh realities of her environment. This quality was supposed to be her enchanting appeal. And I was clear. I wasn't that. The audition was a chemistry read with the wonderful Alan Payne, the film's lead. Alan, respectful, a gentleman, and a very giving artist, made me feel welcome right away. We had a dope rapport, no question, and the readings went very well. At the end of the session, the director and producer began to confer, sending out for people from hair and makeup as I stood there, unsure what was going on. There was something not quite right about the hair on my head, I heard them say as they discussed how to remedy that. There was also talk that I was literally hairy. My eyebrows were bushy and my upper lip had a bit of fuzz on it. As I crossed my arms and stood under the microscope of what's wrong with Jada and her lack of pretty softness, my soon-to-be very close friend, Maxine Renee's head of the hair department, was summoned into the room. So, this is the issue. She had a good read with Alan Payne. But physically, she's not what they want. They want this person who is soft, demure, sweet looking, um, like they said, to play against the harsh realities of the background of the film. So what's happening is that they want her for the part because she, she read well, but they want to change what she looks like physically. So they're calling in hair and makeup to sort of try to do something with her appearance. Then they can make the final decision if she should be the one for the movie. So the hairdresser, Maxine Renee's comes in. She said she loved Maxine instantly, that Maxine had this really warm demeanor. She was very kind. She was very sweet. Um, she had great style. And there was just something about the way she communicated with Jada that didn't make Jada feel as embarrassed as everybody else had had made her feel. Everybody else is sort of judging her and um, like talking about her. She's standing right there and everybody's like talking about, look how fuzzy her upper lip is. You know, is there anything we can do for that? It's masculine, you know, just make making her feel small and stupid, but Maxine um, treated her with dignity and respect. And so, of course, anybody would respond well to that. She said that Maxine asked if she could cut Jada's hair. And um, she said, she asked, you know, how do you feel about that? And Jada said, yeah, I think I can, I, I think I can manage that. She said, with confidence coupled with her fly style, she made me say yes. She smiled that adorable cartoon character grin of hers and said, I have something so cute in mind for you. Judy Murdoch, who was the head of the makeup department and Maxine's close friend, was ordered to wax my brows and upper lip. After a complete makeover, I was presented to Doug and George. That's the director and producer. With that, and with poor Alan Payne advocating like hell for how perfect he thought I was for the role, Doug and George finally gave me the thumbs up. Thanks to Maxine and Judy, this movie was a turning point for me, helping to soften those edges. She said that in the making of this movie, a narrative began running in her head. It started with them wanting to completely give her a makeover before they could ever decide to have her in the movie. Like that was already something that was difficult for her to stand there and to be judged and to have to be changed before anyone would say yes to her. So that started the narrative that you're not good enough, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. Um, and the other issue that came up and would come up again later is the fact that this movie contained an explicit love scene. She didn't want to do it. Um, she says, Jason Lyric was the first movie I'd done that had an explicit love scene in it, which I did not want to do. The producers had agreed up front to hire a body double, but had a very tough time finding one that was a match to me. She says, later, I had the same issue on Set It Off and didn't see the mismatch until the screening. The body double's juicy booty, though really, really appealing, was not my less juicy booty. So immediately she goes to comparing herself with the body double they chose, you know, that given the choice to find somebody who matched her body, they just were like, forget that. Let's go with this other girl. She's more appealing naked anyway. 
And so that immediately she starts comparing herself. But she says the thing that was really hard about Hollywood was that on the one hand, you're being praised at the, in the same moment you're being criticized. So it's praise, criticize, praise, criticize, praise, criticize. And you, you're you just being ping ponged back and forth and your heart hardly knows where to land. She says, I liked making movies, although the daily whiplash challenged my worth. Baby, I would be constantly reminded more than ever how inadequate I was while being praised at the same time. For a 20-year-old, it was confounding. It was like being on a hamster wheel, on a merry-go-round, chasing a carrot. Your performance is stunning. And about the poster for Jason's lyric, is that your thigh showing? We're so sorry, it's too provocative, so we're taking your thigh out. Also, you're so funny. That dress makes you look like a black girl. That's not for the red carpet. Your eyes do so much acting. Black girls on the cover don't sell our magazines. So just constantly feeling like just as she'd made it, she'd get knocked back down. Just as she was complimented, somebody would come right underneath her and just knock her legs out from under her. And it would be really hard to live in, in an environment where you just felt like your worth was always being taken a shot at, you know? And the fact that you are relying on people to build you up. Like, if you don't have a fountain of your own inherent self-worth, because you understand that you're made in the image of God and that you inherently have worth because of that, you are reliant on other people's approval of you because otherwise, where else are you going to get it? So, so you're relying on other people to say positive things about you. But then also the, uh, the back hand of that is that anybody can come and just tear you down with words because you have no inner understanding that it doesn't matter what anybody says doesn't matter what anybody's opinion of me. doesn't matter if somebody doesn't like my eyes. They don't like my body. They don't like this. They don't like that. You know, they think that my thigh showing was provocative when I wasn't trying to be, you know, all of these things can hit less hard if you understand that you have value because you're a human being made in the image of God. You have value, but she's 20 years old. How is she going to know that? How is she going to know that? She's been running her own life for years. What adult figure, who, what guiding principles have been instilled in her so that she could effectively navigate this very negative space where you're constantly being built up and pulled down and built up and pulled down? Who would have the inner scaffolding that is would be necessary to this existence if you hadn't had adults who were actively building into you a structure that could handle this kind of debilitating criticism? Anyway, she says, I was always tired of being kissed on one cheek and backhanded on the other. It was one thing to embrace self-improvement and to adjust to standards of being a leading lady, but where did it end? How could you play the game without getting too caught up to the point where you let the game identify you completely? I had no solutions other than swallowing my discomfort, which I was used to doing. It was a run for the roses to avoid any gnawing insecurity or discontent. They would only slow you down. So she... It's already placing some seeds here, you know, because the chapter is called Breakdown. So this is the first thing we're hearing about. Now, last chapter, of course, we knew she was wilding out, partying, drinking to excess and just being a hot mess. She says it explicitly in the chapter that she was wild. She was rude. She was crazy when she would take drugs and alcohol. Um, so that's one side of the story. But then there's the other side of the story of just feeling like you just are completely irregulated inside by everybody else's projection on you about what you should be. Now, she switches up the conversation to talk about how that hairdresser, Maxine, who'd done her hair for Jason's Lyric, ends up coming to L.A. Um, she had been a native of Canada, but she moves to L.A. and she moves in with Jada. They become roommates. She says that when she turned 21, Maxine wanted to throw her this big birthday party. Maxine was a few years older than Jada, and she believed that a big bash was important, that it was a way for Jada to feel loved and seen and known and all of this. So she wants to throw this big party. Jada didn't want it because she felt like nobody would show up. She thought it's going to be embarrassing when you throw this big party, but then like nobody wants to come. Deep down, I was afraid of disappointment. What if nobody showed up? I resisted, but Max was determined. Eventually, I got to. Fine. The biggest smile came over her face and she hugged me so tight. Thank you, Jade. It's going to be the best party. And she was right. She says that the party was hosted at a West Indian restaurant on Melrose Avenue. And she said she couldn't believe how many people actually did show up. She said there were, she said there were athletes, rappers, actors, and actresses. It was star-studded who's who of friends of mine and friends of friends. The restaurant was tiny, so the party spilled out into the street corner. 
There were all kinds of great food. There was a male stripper, a full bar, dope music, and a video playing on screen as a birthday tribute with some very special footage, including the video of parents don't, just don't understand with Pac and I um, that they had made in high school. I skipped over that story because it seemed kind of dull to me. I didn't know it was going to come back up. When she was in high school, she and Tupac went to an amusement park and they had this one activity where you could make your own music video. And so she and Tupac had been dancing to this video called Parents Just Don't Understand and lip syncing to it. Well, when they showed it at her 21st birthday party, Tupac was horrified. She says Pac came and when he saw the video of us lip syncing, he was not thrilled. He pulled me into a corner and asked, who put up that video? Well, she chastised him and she's like, stop, just stop it already. Nobody's thinking about you. You know, it's not always about you. She laughed, realizing, oh yeah, here I was, like his sister bringing out his baby videos. Of course, Dwayne was there. And at one point, I brushed past Will, who was leaning up against the wall and he wished me a happy birthday. Thank you, Will. And that was that. Oh my goodness gracious, she's just too cool for school. Can't be bothered with Will Smith. And it's like, I mean... Maybe she just really didn't like him. And that's the thing. I, I said that initially. I don't think she's faking nonchalance. I think she really didn't like him. I think it was like, Will Smith. What do I care about that little corny joker who's got that bounce in his step and he's just always perpetually happy? You know, I think that she just looked at him as sort of shallow and uninteresting. Um, now, this is where she gets into the actual breakdown. She says... Earthquakes are very hard to predict. Sometimes you feel tremors ahead of time, but it's not a rule. Often they come on suddenly. She says this is the best way she can describe the events that happened one day when she was driving down Melrose Avenue. So she's driving down Melrose Avenue and a girl that she knew recognized her from her car and they waved to each other and they decided to pull off and say hey to each other. They hadn't seen each other for a while. She says I made a U-turn in the middle of the street to follow her car to the curb and she hopped out and they greeted each other. The girlfriend said, how have you been? I haven't seen you in a while. So Jada starts talking. She says to the girl, yeah, I know. I... And then she just stops talking because suddenly her body feels like it's on fire. She's got like this hot, hot, hot flesh just like washes over all of her. She starts shaking and she realizes that she's standing there with her mouth open and she's not, she just stopped talking. But she's suddenly so distracted by the fact that she's shaking, her body is on fire, and she just bursts into tears because she feels like there's this war going on inside of her body. She's like, you know, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? She feels startled. She feels confused. She doesn't know what she's doing. Her girlfriend clearly can see that something's not okay. She's startled as well. And Jada says, I I'm sorry. I, I don't know what's going on. She reaches out and tries to grab me. Are you okay, Jada? She asks, but I can't even answer. Turning to go, I climb back into my car and drive off, but in moments I realize I'm too rattled to drive. When I reach the next corner, I turn into a side street. I parked and I tried to pull myself together through torrential tears and an avalanche of emotions. I felt incredibly anxious. My heart was beating out of my chest. My breath was short and I couldn't fight off a tidal wave of sadness, a despair that was going to drown me if I didn't get control of myself. It felt like fear and relentless sorrow had sucker punched me. She says, when I got home to an empty house, sadness gave way to an urge I'd never experienced. This is the first time she experiences the desire to do away with herself. And she says that the hurt inside her needed to be stopped. It was so unbearable. The only option was to stop living. The more I tried to unthink the image of harming herself the more afraid she became that she would actually do it. So she says that for the first time ever, I didn't trust myself alone. Then she goes into a series of actions to save herself that don't seem entirely genuine to me. Now, if somebody says they're in distress, by all means, believe them. But believe with caution to a certain extent because sometimes people will show you through their actions that they didn't mean what they're saying. They just need you to care about them. And this is what I mean. She proceeds to call people to come to her aid who are nowhere close enough to come to her aid. She calls her mother in Baltimore and says, Ma, I need you to come. I need you. She calls her friend MC Light, who's on the East Coast. MC Light, I need you to come. I need you to come take care of me. I don't know how I'm going to be. I'm not okay right now. And, 
you know, MC Light doesn't ask any questions. She drops everything she's doing, flies back to LA immediately. Well, they're waiting for um, Jada's mom to be able to arrange with work to get off work so that she can then come to be with Jada. But what I find interesting is that if Jada really thought, I can't be alone, something's really wrong. I'm, I like, it's, it's somebody better show up right now or I might not be here tomorrow. Why would you not call somebody in LA to come and be with you? You know, I'm not saying she didn't feel super dark and scared and sad. And I'm not saying she didn't have a panic attack. But what I'm saying is if she really thought that that it was either get some help in here or I I'm gone, you don't call somebody who has to make flight arrangements to get there, you know, or or who potentially can't be there, you know, Um, because how did she know that MC Light would be able to arrange to fly there? Even as it was, her mother couldn't fly immediately. She had to arrange for work and then she could come. So I just don't know if I think she was really going to do it, but I'm sure she did feel badly. She said that she felt hopeless, that she had never had these dark thoughts in her life before, but she just felt a level of despair she'd never experienced. She says that when MC Light got there, she took care of Jada. Um, She said that Light kept her grounded Um, distancing her from that unhinged feeling that she originally felt when she got home. She said, never one to go into drama. She normalized my days, as did my dogs. Routine can be stabilizing. We'd get up, we'd go to my favorite breakfast spot, Vivian's, and then we'd go out with the Rottweilers. More than anything, light was my anchor in a stormy sea, a symbol that everything was going to be okay till my mom flew in. She said, when my mother arrived, my seams burst all over again. Mom was only a year into her sobriety then, and she had only two weeks to stay, during which she did the best she could to comfort me and help. After working her steps in recovery, she was in touch with how I could be affected by our history. You know, Jada, she would gently suggest, you probably have a lot of stuff to talk about with a therapist, even anger toward me. I didn't want to look at the possibility of being angry at my mother, not at that point. She then suggested that we do therapy together. The prospect of opening up that entire Pandora's box with my mother was too much just then, and I knew that. But I did know that I needed help, and that prompted me to reach out to Debbie Allen, a phone call that began, I'm not doing good. I need some help, somebody to talk to. Debbie, as always, sprang into action on my behalf and arranged for me to be seen the next day by Dr. Sally Gregg, the sweetest therapist who, without a doubt, saved my life. After my first session with her, she requested that I see a psychiatrist so I could be prescribed some meds. The psychiatrist diagnosed me as clinically depressed and put me on Prozac. I resisted. I protested to Dr. Greg, I don't want to be on medication like I'm crazy or something. Jada, this medication is simply to help get your head out of the gray cloud so we can actually deal with the issues that are coming up for you. This won't be forever, and you're not crazy. After a beat, Dr. Greg reassured me, a lot of people get a little assistance to help relieve overbearing depression. Well, she says she got on Prozac, and she said that the warm maternal nature of the doctor helped her to believe this was a good idea. She says, I relinquished my resistance when we agreed to the plan that once I stabilized, I could get off of Prozac pronto. Well, the process took a lot longer than she had anticipated, and one of the side effects was that it completely crashed her libido. She said that that wasn't going to work for me for a long period of time because sex was the one great thing going on in my life. However, as Dr. Greg promised, the meds helped to get my head above the gray clouds and therapy helped me to begin a journey of emotional healing. Now at last, I could see where the wounds came from, then slowly begin the daunting work of forgiveness and acceptance. She says in my early passages of healing, I was ready to be done with Hollywood and I wanted to buy a farmhouse outside of Baltimore. It required a lot of renovation, but the plan was for me to move back home. This way, I could fly to L.A. or go to New York for auditions, but I no longer wanted to be in the Hollywood mix. I needed some peace. I needed some quiet. I needed to breathe. So that's the end of that chapter. It was a shorter chapter. Um, It wasn't packed full of a lot of details, but I think that it's very interesting that she did not want to go on Prozac, but felt sort of um, talked into it. You know, I have my own thoughts about prescription medication and how debilitating I think that it is. Um... Only because I think that it's so quickly prescribed without other kinds of intervention first. As a wife of a combat veteran, um, of somebody who fought in Iraq during the surge in 2006 and 2007, and seeing him and fellow soldiers come home and seeing what it did to them, but then seeing the intervention that's available to them through medicine, it's really disappointing. It's so disappointing how quickly they will tell you, oh, just get on this. 
oh, just get on that. You know, I mean, they're willing to talk to you for 20 minutes and then give you a suitcase full of pills to just do what? Exist like a ghost in your own life, you know? So I, uh, I completely can see why that was not an option that she wanted to take. I don't know all of her situation and if the doctors in her situation thought that was really important, who am I to say? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical professional. But I can say that from a very close vantage point of what doctors will quickly give you just to make you be quiet, to make you like put a bandaid on things and be like, oh, I did my job. I can check a box. I did all that I need to do for you. You know, I gave you a pill. It's pretty disappointing. It's pretty disappointing that that's kind of what our medical establishment does. It's not like, okay, let's figure out why you feel this way. Um, And I know they said, well, it's because we want the gray clouds to go away so you can start to figure out what what went wrong. I bet you could figure some of that out without a pill. But that's just my opinion. And I'm not saying that if anybody who's listening to this has taken medication and found it to be really helpful that, you know, shame on you or, or anything like that. You know, everybody has to do with their doctor what they think needs to be done. I'm just saying that, as a general rule, it's a pill is so easily given when I think other more meaningful therapies could be had first before we immediately go to just medicate you into oblivion. Anyway, I will see you all later. And uh, of course, Trader King on Sunday. So make sure you tune in for that. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.